Okay, so hello everyone uh, and welcome to today's event in the ISTVS digital event series. I'm Massimo Martelli, I'm a researcher at the National Research Council of Italy and the General Secretary of ISTVS. Uh, our series uh, alternates between presentations by established researcher and informal uh, student-led research seminars. Uh, today, uh, we have a Terra Mechanics Bite, and uh, uh, our speaker is Dr. Mehari Takeste, uh, together with some of his students uh, from Iowa State University, uh, presenting their uh, Soil Machine Dynamics Laboratory. And a quick request uh, before we start, uh, in the sidebar on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, please look for sessions. And under sessions, look for the chat tab. And please drop in a short uh, intro of your location, affiliation, uh, and your research interests. Uh, you'll also see a tab called Q&A where you can type uh, questions for our speakers. After the presentation, uh, we will have uh, an open conversation and um, we will ask you to click the blue button at the top right uh, to share your audio and video and join the live conversation. And a moderator will admit you to the discussion. So now, hi, Me hi Mehari. Uh, looking forward uh, to hearing about your work and what you are presenting today. So Mehari can take it from here. Can you see uh, my PowerPoint uh, presentation, Maxim? Yes, yes, I can. Okay, thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity to present soil, dynam soil machine dynamics research at Iowa State. I want to introduce first uh, 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 the team. Myself, Dr. Elnaz Ibrahimi, a postdoctoral associate, uh, Pius uh, Jagawe, uh, Nisreen Al Khalifa, uh, Young Nan, uh, Seth uh, Sanchez. So, uh, in our group, we focus on physical systems modeling um, of materials and their interaction with the machine, trying to apply the soil dynamics principles uh, and, and traction mechanics. Uh, for our research, uh, because there's a lot of interest in uh, in managing uh, precision ag technologies or, or data analytics for soil compaction and tillage, we also uh, work on this on those areas. Um, in our lab, uh, we uh, are trying to do material characterization, calibration for uh, 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 physics-based models. Uh, do some testing capability, and then the new lab that uh, was established in 2019 that I will go over through and some of the uh, uh, ongoing projects on it. Um, so our team will uh, present. Uh, Nasreen and Pius, they are uh, new grad students, started uh, last uh, 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 two weeks. So they, they are uh, trying to learn and uh, take classes, uh, but they will have uh, a few uh, say what they were there, what they're doing in the lab. So Dr. Ibrahimi and uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Young will give uh, the, their talk. Uh, uh, Seth, she uh, could not join, and I will try to explain what uh, what she has uh, done so far. Uh, I think this is just a brief intro. Uh, for me, you know, one of the uh, motivations in, uh, you know, how do we integrate soil or crop models into uh, uh, simulation-based design or, or granular flows. Uh, a lot of this off-road equipment machines, uh, they are designed. Uh, they are also evaluated their performance based on uh, either how much dirt they move or how much you know uh, uh, force they apply 
to uh, to uh, create a soil tills uh, necessary for a certain application. It could be agriculture or it could be uh, construction. So a lot of them has also uh, a, a traction component, uh, uh, mobility systems, and those are also driven by uh, you know how to uh, interact uh, for uh, maximum energy efficiency uh, with the ground. So one of the biggest opportunities is to apply uh, computational models, uh, either uh, uh, in real time uh, uh, or or uh, high fidelity, uh, time consuming uh, uh, simulation methods. The challenges in all those is uh, one is the material type and conditions vary. Um, and uh, choosing the right uh, continuum or discontinuum mechanics or even analytical for capturing the uh, uh, the material behaviors and how do we uh, uh, develop material model or proper calibration of those uh, and then integrate those into uh, into either a, a design process or or recently into a new uh, of this uh, intelligent technologies for algorithm developments so for uh, for a lot of the research, uh, what we have is a uh, soil uh, machine dynamics laboratory at Iowa State. Um, it's uh, fairly new. Uh, it has three major equipments. Uh, what you see on the top is a single tire testing uh, with a soil processing carriage. Uh, with the single tire tester, uh, it's capable of uh, uh, running or controlling a test for uh, mobility systems, either uh, tire or track, uh, with uh, sleep uh, uh, up to uh, 15, oh, it, it could be higher than that, uh, but for a range of uh, slip uh, and controlling the vertical uh, loads on, uh, on the tire. So it's a small tire, it's not a very large tire. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we developed uh, artificial soil then for uh, for uh, doing the tests with the mobility systems. I'll explain a little bit what is that artificial soil. The other one is um, it's a ground engaging tool soil bin. It's the mainly for uh, design performance uh, and, uh, and control applications of uh, attachments to vehicles, either a bulldozer blade or, or reaper points at a geometrically scaled uh, uh, version. What you see in the middle is a circular wear test. Uh, we use it for uh, validating uh, any hardening uh, uh, tools for tillage application. And now we're trying to also uh, use the data for uh, uh, collecting uh, uh, to calibrate uh, wear models on, on tools. Uh, it was working good. <laughs> uh, I think, let me just, hey, before I tried it yesterday, it was fine. But uh, the bin is uh, 27 meter long, about a meter and a half wide. Uh, currently, it has uh, a half a meter depth uh, uh, soil, and the soil we're using is an artificial soil that mimics uh, cohesive uh, frictional soil. So the uh, bigger picture, uh, the mission of our lab is to develop innovative testing methods uh, for measurement of soil mechanics behaviors under dynamic loading, either from uh, mobility systems or ground engaging tools, and, uh, and able to develop a physics-based uh, models uh, for those applications and, uh, and use the lab for uh, undergraduate and graduate engineering education. So I teach uh, uh, two undergraduate and one graduate class. The graduate class is mainly focused on soil machine interaction, uh, both uh, with uh, computational modeling applications. So the trend that uh, that we have seen, uh, you know, over the recent years in uh, for uh, helping uh, uh, advances either in uh, in the intelligent technologies or controls is do we want to go with the high fidelity models or somewhat uh, real time or reduced order models? Uh, there's always a trade-off. 
uh, hopefully you know with uh, with our new uh, uh, lab capabilities uh, we might uh, provide uh, a direction on you know how good is the physics how much is the accuracy and repeatability if we go with the high fidelity or or reduced time model so the uh, soil machine dynamics is, is key to validate that physics uh, when there is a good particle model developed. So the approach uh, uh, that, uh, that um, uh, we use in our lab, uh, uh, especially for the computational modeling in this case for DEM applications. Uh, DEM is, uh, is uh, you have to discretize the particles and they don't necessarily have to match, uh, you know, one to one in particle size, because for uh, uh, numerical purposes, uh, the uh, particles uh, are represented as a clump of spheres, which is more efficient for computation. Uh, since the shape is not one to one to uh, a, a real physical uh, uh, particles, uh, what we do is we try to follow. Uh, a system engineering approach where we would first try to approximate the shapes uh, and the particle size distribution based on the lab measurements of either like soil or even an aggregates of soil, uh, depending on what application to use. And then do proper uh, physics based calibration uh, before uh, applying it for a, a, a large uh, application simulations. Now, where the lab is coming is. Uh, uh, calibrations are often done either with a standard simple laboratory testers or uh, customized uh, build uh, uh, simple tools. When it comes to uh, a, a real application, a large size, uh, there is a, a, a gap. And that gap is where you ha might have a dynamics involved or there might be some uh, uh, multi responses of uh, particles. For example, if you have a bulldozer, you first have to penetrate it, cut it, level it. You know, all those steps may not be able captured in a simple uh, either ASTM standard or, or lab build calibration procedures. So for those, uh, we have what we call a validation step and uh, we would use the, uh, uh, the Sol Machine Dynamics Lab. I would like to give also a quick highlight on uh, what do we do, what have we done so far on two up, uh, broader uh, particulate systems. Uh, one is the uh, crop materials, another one is the soil. This is just to, to give uh, a flavor on, uh, you know, how, how do we apply the knowledge that we have at the uh, soil uh, machine dynamics or crop mechanics behaviors. So this is uh, from uh, uh, previous uh, graduate students in the lab. Uh, what you see on the top is simulating a screw auger when a corn grain is flowing through an auger. Uh, on the bottom is, uh, is a mass flow sensor on a combine to measure the uh, uh, yield measurement. So we calibrated those uh, two key uh, physical uh, uh, systems uh, in a grain engaging uh, uh, components of a combine harvester. What you see on the on the uh, uh, on the right is it's a fibrous uh, bio mass particles. Um, on the bottom is uh, we're uh, uh, simulating for calibration purposes of uh, uh, corn uh, plant. So when a combine harvests so corn, it has all the parts. Uh, that is, it has a husk, it has a stock, it has a kernel, and it also has the cup. So for uh, a whole plant uh, uh, mechanical separation, uh, what you see here is, is a mechanical sieving of uh, the, those different uh, particles. In the next step, uh, the, uh, how we will try to integrate this to soil is most of agricultural soils, they have a residue. Uh, right after harvest, or or if there is a, a high residue in a no-till system for, during planting operation, uh, we will try to uh, uh, integrate this uh, flexible particles uh, into a soil uh, 
uh, for uh, machine design or machine performance analysis. Another one that uh, uh, we have uh, completed uh, 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 and it's published is, can we apply simulated laws uh, in simulation uh, analysis We're using uh, DEM discrete element modeling? So we uh, were able to uh, reproduce uh, uh, a solvent test data whose geometrically scaled uh, bulldozer that has 24%, 14%, 10%, and 5% of a full-scale bulldozer uh, based on the simulated law that was published uh, work from a Solben. Uh, we were trying to simulate that in uh, discrete element modeling and can simulation be used uh, to establish that scaling law. The, the uh, purpose for that is computational models or this high fidelity models are very computationally expensive. So if there is uh, a good scaling law established, uh, you could run uh, the appropriate scale geometrically of, of the tool and, uh, and validate the physics much quicker and use the uh, scaling law to quantify the performance of a full scale machine. So from this work, uh, we were able to see a very good correlation between the DEM and, uh, and the soil horizontal forces from a solvent on those uh, uh, different scale plates. So with that, um, uh, I will uh, now have this uh, uh, ongoing current uh, uh, research activities at the Soil Machine Dynamics Lab. Uh, one of the things that we uh, are trying to leverage uh, the lab uh, with graduate research is to, uh, to do traction mechanics, especially with the artificial soil, uh, to, to do more repeatable and, uh, uh, and controlled tests uh, and be able to use the, uh, 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 the data that we have uh, with some uh, collaborators uh, on, uh, on doing tire soil modeling. So it's an ongoing project. Uh, we, I did some work uh, prior to uh, having a new uh, graduate students. Um, uh, and I would like to see uh, what we're doing on this one. So Nasreen or Pius, do you have, uh, can you say a little bit uh, since this is uh, your first time uh, joining a group like this uh, since you start school? Nasreen or Pius, this would be good for, uh, for you to present to this uh, seminar, uh, but maybe I'll go over it quickly uh, uh, as, as an introduction, but in the next time you can present this. Hello. Hello. Go ahead, we, we hear you, Nisri. Massimo, is that okay? okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. This is a little bit of introduction about me. My name is Nisreen, and I'm a new grad student in um, ABE at Iowa State University. I um, currently work in Soil Machine Dynamics Laboratory under Dr. Takasi. Uh, I'm still figuring out my project, so at the current moment, I have no particular project, but I have, I'm working on the literature review that's on um, tire soil interaction and analytical models. But my research goals are to develop research on traction mechanics using analytical methods and models. So that's all. Thank you, Nisri. Uh, Pius, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. You want, to, you want to say a few things on, uh, you know, what uh, what you have started so far, and your name, please. Uh, yes. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Pius. Um, new grad student this fall at Iowa State University in the Agriculture and Biosystems Engineering Department. Um, 
a graduate research assistant in the soil machine dynamics lab under the supervision of Dr. Tekeste. Uh, currently, I've uh, started uh, literature review in uh, traction mechanics. Uh, I'm also just uh, trying uh, to figure out uh, the research I'm going to undertake for my thesis. So at the moment, it's a literature review that's being done uh, in predicting tessel interaction using uh, high fidelity computational models. Good, thank you. Yes. Uh, yeah, so in this research, uh, what, uh, what we are trying to understand is investigate the effects of tire inflation pressure uh, on the uh, uh, tire soil uh, interaction, either in the contact pressure, contact area, or footprint, or the traction forces, and and uh, predict those uh, uh, from uh, analytical models and uh, high fidelity models. Uh, we're exploring uh, either a finite element approach or a DEM approach yet. And then uh, how do we, you know, uh, I will show some uh, slides here. So uh, uh, one thing that uh, we are trying to do is trying to develop a method for a footprint measurements. So what you see on the top uh, are two machines, a uh, row crop tractor and, uh, and a track, uh, track tractor. Uh, when you have the row crop uh, uh, wheel tractors, uh, you could manage uh, 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 the tire inflation pressure to get uh, a maximum uh, contact area possible, uh, gain traction and minimize uh, minimize compaction. Uh, with the track, it has uh, you know the wider uh, footprint. But how do we quantify uh, the contact area uh, or the footprint? So what you see on the top is a measurement uh, that uh, was uh, was taken in the field. Uh, one thing that we learned, you know, was a field approach is uh, the soil condition dictates the accurate measurements, uh, either if it rains or what kind of uh, soil preparation you will do. So uh, in our lab, uh, it gives us the opportunity to do a control test uh, with the artificial soil. Uh, you could see that uh, this uh, uh, test uh, might allow us to get more accurate uh, prediction uh, or estimation uh, rather of a footprint uh, under a different tire inflation pressure and how much is the difference uh, uh, was, uh, for example, uh, the track, uh, uh, track tractor. Because entire uh, soil mechanics uh, or, or uh, track soil mechanics, uh, the main steps is the load uh, applied on a given area at a, a given pressure distribution, uh, either with, with uh, a, a tire inflation pressure management or a track, and then propagate that into, into the soil for a stress uh, 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 and strained relationships. So we want to do this baby step first to look at uh, a footprint. Any questions, uh, Massimo, would, uh, should we stop for questions or should we just continue? Sorry, uh, I should have asked that earlier. Oh, no, no, no problem. Just please, uh, Mahari, you can, you can go ahead till the end of your presentation and then uh, people can can type their questions in the Q&A tab in the window and we will collect them and then have you uh, answer them at the end. And then we will also uh, invite people to join you on stage for the live discussion. So just uh, please go, go ahead with the presentation and then we'll have the Q&A and discussion at the end. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, for the tire soil uh, prediction models, I think one approach we're looking is, uh, you know, uh, review the analytical models, how, how do they relate, especially in, in predicting motion resistance ratio. Uh, this work was presented at an annual conference of American Society of uh, Ag Engineers, 
And uh, with the uh, tire test at uh, two tire inflation pressures under one, uh, which is four kilonewton load, uh, we were able to characterize first the uh, plate sinkage relationship, direct shear, and, and predicting those uh, with uh, uh, Becker and Reese model for the soil behavior in the plate sinkage, and then uh, Janossi and uh, Hanamoto for the direct shear and get the uh, um, the soil parameters. So there are different analytical models here. I will just present on Wismer and Luce, uh, but we're also doing uh, you know the Reese and Becker approach uh, for uh, for predicting the uh, uh, motion resistance ratio. With the Wismer and Luce, uh, we were able to get uh, you know accuracy close to um, uh, eleven percent max, uh, up to you know three percent for uh, the uh, low tire inflation pressure. Now the main thing here uh, for us, you know, with the graduate research uh, starting this kind of work is. Um, for example, under uh, very uh, deformable conditions. Uh, or very uh, like in a field condition, for example, wet. Uh, there's a lot of bulldozer effect uh, from the soil uh, under a high sinkage. So how do we, uh, ha did those analytical models incorporate those and what are some of the soil parameters that need to be measured and, and, and uh, validated? For the high fidelity model, uh, Seth, she's an undergraduate research assistant, uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, smart. Uh, as you know that, uh, you know, getting a tire model is, uh, is a step-by-step -step process. Uh, we don't know yet uh, the material properties of this tire. Uh, either we will try to retrieve it from a literature or, or or uh, work with uh, collaborators. But for our purpose right now, what we're trying to do is trying to bring the, uh, uh, the geometry of the tire and, uh, and test it both in a finite element or even discrete element uh, uh, coupled with, uh, uh, with dynamics modeling. So what set has started is uh, creating a geometry of the existing tire that we have it's uh, 235 slash 75 R15. Uh, the challenge that she came up with uh, was, you know, how do you get the accurate geometry of, of the lugs uh, uh, to be put into a CAD model? So uh, uh, she's, uh, she has started using a 3D scanner that we have in our lab to get the details of, uh, uh, of the lag. So one of the approach uh, in the tire model generation is what's developed by Abacus. And uh, we might be able to leverage that for the graduate research to see, you know, can we use that either with uh, literature data on the tire model or even get some of the, the tire uh, properties in collaboration with, uh, with some uh, researchers. In the validation step, that's a key uh, because we have to validate the physics. Uh, we will go step by step. Right now, what uh, we are predicting, uh, measuring also the uh, uh, rat uh, behavior. Uh, we want to see, you know, how good is either DEM or FEM, especially the coupled or Eulerian uh, Lagrangian model, uh, would be able to get the the contact behavior and then the traction forces uh, from the instrumented single wheel uh, that we have in the lab. Seth so would have uh, presented this. Okay, I think I will stop here. So uh, for uh, the traction mechanics or tire soil modeling, uh, for the other type of uh, two uh, topics, uh, Young will, uh, will present this. And then uh, we have a last one on uh, deep soil compaction from pipeline application. Dr. Ibrahimi will present that. So Young, I can move this uh, if uh, you want me uh, and you can talk about it. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Okay, 
All right, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jong, um, and I'm uh, actually a senior majoring in agriculture engineering, power and machinery options, and currently working as an undergraduate research assistant in Dr. Takesta's lab as well. So I will briefly explain about the project um, that I've been doing. So um, the project that I've been working on was the design of robotic wooden ground ground engaging tools um, often involves limited to soil to tool interaction for tool design optimization, energy efficiency, and their relationship to wheat um, efficiency. Um, typically in wood uh, organic framing, growing trends, various ground engaging tools, attachments are used for robotic mechanic wither. Uh, better understanding of the soil, dynamic behavior and design performance analysis of soil to two interaction could be done using DEM simulation coupled with uh, multi-body dynamics. Objective of the study is to evaluate three robotic with their tools, performance on soil mixing um, using DEM technique and validate the simulation using data collected on soil mixing and within efficiency, uh, efficacy at University of Maine. Uh, so the first three photos on the very top of the slides are the mechanical withers we had from University of Maine. Uh, uh, so the GET stands for grounding engaging tools. Uh, what I've done was the, I measure all the geometry and dimensions of those tools and made the CAD model by using uh, SOLIDWORKS, as you can see on the picture in the bottom. The challenge, challenges that I have um, making a CAD model was the angles and the other uh, dimensions, and there was a spring on it. So I had some time to figure out how to do all the with the uh, SOLIDWORKS. So on the next slide, um, to do the simulation, we are using uh, EDEM software, uh, which is basically the uh, software that allows to simulate the interaction between the tool and the soil par particle that you set on it. Um, here are some pictures of the installation of the CAD model of finger reader on the top and the time rakes on the bottom into the EDEM. Uh, so in this EDEM, you can set the positions of the input models and the time duration, like test time, that how long they are and how fast they're going to interact with the particles. When you start the simulation, um, as you can uh, see on the picture, that will move along with the direction, the red arrow in the, on the slice. That will have a contact with the soil particles, particles, and you can have the um, analysis of the simulation, how the tool engage in the soil particles at the end of the test. So, uh, yeah, that's all I have for the presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ibrahimi, are you on the line? Um, hello, everyone. Yes, I am. Okay. Yeah, so I can move the slides and uh, you can walk. Uh, and present the, this topic to the audience, please. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Elnaz Ebrahimi. I have been involved in a project uh, called Effect of the uh, Right Away Activities on uh, Soil and Crop Production in Dr. Tegesley's lab since two, 2019. And uh, the project uh, goal is investigation of the 
pipeline installation on uh, soil component, soil materials, and also crop yield. Uh, Mahari, would you mind to? Okay, thank you. So this project started in 2016. And uh, after that, uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, uh, which uh, maybe some of you are aware, um, crossed uh, the Iowa, uh, state of Iowa from uh, this, uh, this project has started from Dakota um, and uh, transferring the, the oil from Dakota to the Illinois. And part of this um, has been in Iowa soil, uh, which is mainly croplands. And uh, this project that uh, we have been um, uh, doing uh, is investigating that the how installation of the pipelines uh, affects on the soil property and how um, affects the, the crop yield. Because most of the farmers has been complaining about the yield loss uh, oftentimes, uh, the, the soil property uh, doesn't recover for a long time, especially some of them even takes 10 years. Uh, they have some reclamation uh, strategies that they have applied the, the farm after uh, that they buried the, the pipe in the soil. And our goal was to look at those uh, reclamation methods that if those are effective, if those methods are um, helping the soil to recover faster, or there are some uh, other methods that uh, we need to look for. Uh, our experimental farm was uh, uh, is located between Story County and Boone. And uh, the project uh, started in 2016, right um, after that uh, pipeline buried in the soil. Uh, farm was based on corn that time uh, what they did they after that they had a trench and buried the pipe um, the first they actually uh, piled the subsoil separated the subsoil and topsoil and piled uh, aside and after burying the pipe uh, they tried to re uh, to to bring back the, the top and subsoil so one of the uh, consequences of uh, this procedure that uh, is done when they uh, have a pipeline installation uh, is machinery, heavy machinery trafficking that happens. And the second is blending the soil, topsoil and subsoil, which has a uh, serious impact on the uh, crop growth. So in this project, uh, the right of way area was divided to different zones and we investigated the, the crop yield and soil property based on different zones. The area that pipe was buried, we used to call it, we call it zone one, which is trench. The area that uh, highly was highly trafficked, uh, we uh, classified as zone two. Zone three was the, the lightly trafficked area that we noticed and piled and zone X were, were in the, the area that soil was piled up and zone X was the place that they used to keep the um, pipe on it. We had in, we have in this farm uh, two control area that uh, we didn't, the soil has not been, uh, isn't gone uh, through the any process um, during the right of way activities in 2016. After that, um, and they also uh, installed, um, uh, we had also two reclamation methods that uh, was already applied by the, the company. And uh, this method is subsoiling and they applied it in two depths. And we wanted to investigate that if uh, subsoiling the soil after uh, repacking um, has uh, any shows any differences if it is applied in 300 millimeters or 450 millimeters. After that, um, after application of the subsoil in 2016, uh, we uh, started to look at the, the effect of the additional management system uh, based on the tillage. We have we also divided the farm to two tillage to, to tillage system. 
uh, we looked for uh, conventional tillage effect and also we looked uh, the effect of the no tillage. And so uh, here I'm highlighting just some of the results. This project is long-term project and uh, still ongoing this year. And it's based on the rotation, uh, corn soybean rotation. So we had measurements of um, soil penetration resistant or cone index, uh, bulk density, uh, all of the soil physical properties, soil moisture, and crop yield, uh, crop growth and yield. And we also applied some cropping system uh, simulation modeling. So based on our results, uh, soil penetration resistance has uh, increased, which is persistent based on our measurement from uh, 2017 uh, and up to 2020 that uh, we have done the measurement. And um, the highest uh, compaction has happened, has occurred at the uh, depths of uh, 30 to 45 centimeter. There was some effect from subsoiling tillage, uh, subsoiling depth, and uh, however, subsoiling didn't help uh, much for recovery, but it helped for um, the reducing the compaction at the at the same year. So, as a consequence, uh, when such a compaction happens and when cone index is higher than two that prevents the, the root growth and penetration to the soil and um, the soil depth and consequently reduces the, the crop growth, growth rate and uh, biomass accumulation. And uh, also prevent the uh, water and nutrient uptake. So as a consequence of a compaction, uh, we observed that uh, plant height and growth rate has been reduced uh, dramatically, especially in uh, corn, as you see in the picture. We also um, analyzed, have analyzed the, the yield and biomass production. And in all years, uh, until last year, that uh, we have um, measured the yield and uh, analyzed the crop component, all of the, the crop component has been reduced in the, in the compacted area compared when it's compared to the non-compacted or control area. This uh, reduction uh, varied uh, between 17 to 28% in the corn and soybean. And also we, um, the one of the another consequences that uh, this reduction had and we observed was soil cover reduced. And as you see in the picture, the this is after harvest and uh, in the no-tillage no -tillage based system. And you can see that the amount of the residue on the soil surface is dramatically different from disturbed to non-disturbed. And uh, the lowest is disturbed soil, uh, which uh, there was no material on the soil surface. And uh, the right picture shows the disturbed and uh, undisturbed area. Another um, interesting results that we uh, we found in this this project is effect of the the soil disturbance on soil structure and quality, and also uh, root decomposition. So we are trying to investigate different aspects of um, uh, soil compaction on crop production to uh, find out what exactly happens and why it takes 10 years to uh, crop and soil to recover from uh, after right-of-way right of activities. So in this, uh, the left picture shows the, the soil structure uh, based on uh, visual analysis, uh, visual, uh, visual observation. And uh, in this picture, uh, it's highlighted that uh, the soil aggregates, the size has uh, has changed and soil uh, quality has changed and uh, porosity of course has uh, has been uh, affected by the soil compaction and consequently we, we found that uh, there is uh, dramatic uh, changes in the soil and root decomposition so the the right graph shows that the root mass 
uh, was uh, after harvest, uh, which we assume that the start the roots, the root litter start uh, decomposing in the soil gradually, uh, has been accumulated more than uh, what is a standard uh, root root amount in the soil uh, for Iowa soil. So normally, uh, root mass in the the soil depth of zero to uh, 100 centimeter or 120 centimeter is about uh, 1,000 kilogram per hectare. Uh, but what we have here, it is something around 3,000 kilogram per hectare of roots in the which accumulated and non-decomposed uh, roots in the uh, soil depth of zero to uh, 120. Um, and you can see that how significantly different uh, the values. So um, uh, this project has still uh, one more year to go and uh, we are trying to, actually this is, we are the final year and we are trying to wrap up our results and um, um, would be glad if you have uh, questions to uh, please ask your questions and we will be glad to answer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Valna. Uh, I think uh, that wraps up our uh, we have a, a website in uh, the Iowa State about the lab, and uh, you're most welcome to visit. You know, we look forward for uh, any collaboration or graduate students uh, interested to do research uh, at Iowa State uh, Cyclone Fund Group. <laughs> but this, uh, I uh, I want to uh, open the floor for. Uh, either comments, uh, suggestions, or questions uh, for me or uh, for the team. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Mahari. And and thanks uh, to all the, the speakers for, uh, for the very interesting presentation you gave today. And uh, so I see we have uh, Ray already, already live. Uh, so he had uh he had a question ready so please ray hello dr Tekeste. um i have a few questions for you um you spoke about using uh, artificial soil um, and it simulates cohesion um how do you achieve that does it contain clay and what is the particle size you are using um what what density how do you measure the density of your prepared soil bin sure uh, thanks for for uh, for asking yeah so uh, the artificial soil mix is uh, is uh, trying to remake uh, mimic uh, like a co cohesive fractional behavior of a soil for uh, their mechanical properties since uh, you know there's no water in it so the chem the composition of it uh, we we tried to engineer it uh, based on the need to create uh, this uh, cohesive frictional behavior soil. Okay, okay. Um, and then also I'd like to ask about, you spoke about, uh, uh, you did do pressure sinkage tests uh, with a plate. Um, how did you model the plastic failure uh, uh, under the plate, did you use the DEM, FEM, or uh, analytical approach? Yeah, let me open that, okay? Share this. Can you see this? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So the plate seekage, uh, uh, there are uh, the one is uh, you know getting the data on this artificial soils. Uh, the second one was uh, doing a DEM, what you see on the red. Uh, so the model, the contact model that I used it uh, for this, is the Herzian model with uh, with uh, JKR, but uh, I'm also uh, I have also started to to see uh, 
if uh, I would use the uh, what they call in uh, in uh, Edom the Edom bra model. It's a, it's an elastoplastic model. So I uh, there, I started with this uh, simpler model because it's uh, easier to calibrate. There are very few uh, DM parameters compared to the most uh, complicated one. Uh, so uh, the next step is uh, to uh, uh, to to get the uh, 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 elastoplastic model. So when you think about a pre pressure, the pressure uh, plate sinkage, uh, as you could see, you know, the uh, Herzian that uh, was JKR uh, was able to, to predict the forces, right? Uh, but the behavior of the material, uh, both the rebounding and, uh, uh, and the dilation, uh, I would say it still needs improvement. Uh, maybe that's why uh, you know the uh, the plastic part uh, has not been uh, fully captured in this model. Um, uh, then, for uh -huh. your model, how did you um, obtain the um, soil properties or parameters, the input like the friction angle and all that uh, for for your model? Uh, did you use the pressure sinkage itself to get it, or use some other method uh, to get those properties to? to yeah, sure, sure. Um, what uh, you know, what we do is we use uh, optimization scheme of uh, first doing sensitivity analysis. Uh, with this one, you know, I use uh, the plate sinkage as a calibration uh, experiment itself. Uh, the initialization of the parameters, uh, or some of them, the uh, the actual measurements were done. Uh, from the uh, uh, direct shear test, uh, you know, such as the soil to soil internal friction angle being as an initial estimate of the friction coefficient, uh, and then the soil to steel uh, uh, internal friction angle as an initial estimate of the uh, uh, the plate and and soil friction coefficient. Uh, for the rolling uh, model, the rolling coefficient. It was uh, done uh, by a little sensitivity analysis uh, in, in getting the results. The uh, JKR cohesion was not one-to-one uh, -to, -one to the uh, Moore-Coulomb uh, cohesion, uh, but I use it there as, uh, as a, like a surrogate uh, response for, for uh, this calibration too. So the answer is uh, the plate sinkage was used as a calibration uh, was uh, uh, measured data from uh, the uh, standard testers that we know. Mm. Uh, your uh, results are quite amazing. <laughs> um, and yeah. then I would just like to know, um, you mentioned there are opportunities for graduate researchers. Um, is there ones available for PhD research? Um, yeah, I'm currently a master's student uh, at another university. Yes, uh, right. Yeah, uh, uh, please reach out to me. Um, that's uh, uh, I uh, in in my group. I'm very interested to uh, to uh, get a PhD students in the lab. Uh, right now, at least in this fall, uh, there's no funding, but uh, uh, I think there there are prospects, very positive prospects. So please, uh, you know, reach out to me. Uh, I would be glad to to arrange a time about this. Okay, thank you. Um, I have actually many questions, but I think maybe uh, we should give someone else a chance. Uh, but I also wanted to ask about the scaling effect on the bulldozer test you did. Um, did you do a dimensional analysis and did you have to alter your particle size for the smaller ones um, uh, for the testing and yeah, what did it involve? Maybe that's that's going to be your PhD research if you join. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what uh, what we had applied uh, right here is uh, what uh, uh, Dr. Schaeffer and uh, others at the USDA lab used to call it uh, uh, distorted soil model. Okay. The distorted soil model is uh, you do the geometric scaling. Uh, in this case, they, they ran it all uh, at 20% of the uh, the height of the, the blade, um, and they uh, running it at uh, you know a fixed speed for sure for this uh, validation work. Uh, but I have not done 
okay, the uh, scaling of uh, the soil model parameters. Uh, what I did was I made sure that the uh, uh, ratio of the particle diameter, uh, first of all, the particles were, uh, were not just simply defined uh, by uh, what you call like uh, arbitrary. So that all might have also helped. So uh, we did a, a proper screening uh, through uh, ASTM uh, sieves and, uh, and characterize a different shape uh, using a 3D scanner and fill those uh, uh, measured uh, geometries with uh, clamped spheres. So the, the particles used uh, were properly scaled to the cut depths of the blades, uh, at least to the minimum, uh, which is a uh, blade uh, number seven. Uh, but the DM properties were calibrated to cone penetration reading. Uh, you're right, so that uh, at least with the distorted soil model, uh, as uh, suggested from uh, you know prior research, uh, this, this seemed to predict well. Uh, but I think that we have to reinvestigate again uh, for uh, simulation, especially DEM, since there is opportunity to to do uh, scaling of the M properties and size, uh, which they were not able to do it in an experimental. Uh, th this is really a good yeah, question. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I went a little longer because that's, uh, that's a very good question. OK, thank you very much, Dr. Tikistian. OK, thanks. Thanks, Ray, for joining the conversation. and. Uh, I see here in, in the Q&A tab, we have a question uh, from Dr. Alex Keen and uh, a question from Dr. George Mason. And instead of me reading those questions, I would like to invite Alex and George to, to join the, the conversation live and so, so that they can, they can ask the question and join the discussion. So... George, Alex, if you're so inclined, please click. Huh. Oh, here is George. <laughs> I'm upside down. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay, the, the question has to do with the, uh, the DEM model. Are you using XDM for the interface between the FEM and DEM model, or what kind of interface are you using? Uh, George, are you referring to the tire soil interaction? Yes. <laughs> Yes, that's that's a goal. Uh, there are some uh, published work uh, now where I uh, where we're trying to collaborate. With, there is a new group that are interested on in this. Is they have uh, developed a simplified tire model. Uh, so we're trying to work with them for for applying their methodology on the simplified tire model. So the tire will be a finite element. The soil be uh, like a DEM. Yeah, the the interface gets a little tricky, but there's been some work published on that. Uh, the, there are four or five tire models in Chrono, so you, you get a chance you might look at that because they are they do have the parameters for them. It's it's for a um, Humvee tire in that case. I think thirty six inch. Um, I need to do this in meters, don't I? Uh, the, the other question has to do in the field, are you using both a becker and cone, or are you, are you using a becker and cone in the lab too, uh, bevometer? Yeah, so the in the lab, I have not done, uh, the, the, in the field, we, we use only cone penetrometer. I haven't used it, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, okay. the, the plate sinkage. In the lab, though, we use both, yes. So, so maybe you can build a database and get correlations between the two, but or, or maybe show that there aren't. But uh, that that would be of interest. I, that's all I have. That, that's, that's all. Yeah, George. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, I think uh, I I uh, I read some of the recent uh, published work from you and others. Uh, do you know if this chrono models are 
are available to the public? Uh, yes, yes, yes. So uh, University of Wisconsin has been been the keeper of it for, but uh, uh, it's open source and and uh, and it's um, got a DM model in there too, and FEM. Uh, it's, it's it it may be worth looking at. I, you did something on SolidWorks, one of the guys, and so that looked like a almost a shear ring of sorts. It looks like he was attempting to do shear analysis of the surface. Was that correct? Was that that soil test instrument that was done with the solid works? No, we have not done any simulation yet. Are you talking about this one? Uh, no, it had some tines on it. It looked like a series of tines in, in a circle, concentric circle. Um, uh, who, who's doing your solid works? There, that's it. There. Oh, that's for that's for weeders. Okay, I thought it made them a soil tester. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm. I, I, I missed that. All right, I'm good. I'm good. That, that's interesting. It, it, it that almost looks like uh, it, it could be used for a, a shear device on the surface. Shear device. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> We use, right. I use uh, we use a shear vein in the field too. By the way, I forgot to mention that. Um, it's uh, yeah. I think that's that's uh, really an open area of discussion. Uh, uh, maybe at the uh, uh, ISTVS is uh, how do we how do we design in situ type measurements for especially those very large tires? They have a very large lag. And they they are uh, low ground pressure tires too. The, the tires that you saw here, uh, you know, the recommended tire inflation pressure is like six psi on uh, R50 uh, uh, rim diameter tires. So with those, uh, you know, the type of measurement you do in the soil, especially on the top few inches, is uh, I don't think we have a very good uh, method in the field right now. Okay. Yeah, so this opens up a, a good view, especially the the uh, what do you call the finger weeder, right? <laughs> yes, yes, well, yes. All right. Well, uh, thank you, thank you, Alex. And we'll turn it over to you. <laughs> right. Hello. Hello, Mahari. Alex. <laughs> Yeah, uh, uh, a few issues they're getting on. I don't know whether there was a limit to the number of uh, uh, people can attend this part, but I'm on now. Um, my question's really linked to to um, to the the ones that Ray was asking earlier, because uh, uh, there was a, a post grad session last week, and this topic did come up, and we discussed it with Ray a little bit, and that was when you're preparing uh, soil tracks what measurements you need to do and um, how you can compare one set of, of tests against another. I mean, the, fir the first question one uh, I was quite interested in was you've talked about the cohesive frictional soil uh, and it sounds like you make that up. Did you look at anybody else's soil bins when you decided the ratio of, of, uh, of constituents of clay, silt and sand or is this soil fairly representative of Iowa conditions more generally? Yeah. So, uh, you know, when, um, uh, when we uh, uh, have this, uh, the soil bin, uh, the discussion was, you know, what kind of soil do we use? Uh, is it natural soil or, or artificial soil? And uh, I look into the... Uh, uh, published uh, soil bin composition uh, from uh, UK, Dr. Godwin, uh, uh, the Auburn Lab. Um, I think uh, Dr. Lyle, you know, a different of them. Most of uh, the, the, what, I, what I remember is um, the ones that are very good for repeatable tests are the sandy soils of uh, soil bin. Uh, I also look the one uh, from, from Israel. Uh, none of them are uh, artificial. They were all uh, natural uh, soils. Uh, so the uh, the target, uh, the the hypothesized target of cohesion uh, frictional uh, uh, soil, uh, 
uh, I was trying to get as close to the loam soil that we have here, uh, for, for especially for the cohesion part. Uh, but what it turned out to be was uh, it, the soil ended up to be more of a frictional with a less of the cohesion. So uh, it's not as very close to what we have here at Long Soil. Uh, but the frictional behavior of it uh, was, uh, was very close to many of the, the soil being uh, published uh, soil to soil friction angle uh, from, uh, from literature on... Uh, I don't have the library yet. I didn't, you know, quantify, you know, how much deviation was it from the the library of uh, soil in soils uh, uh, from from uh, these different institutions. Uh, but I think uh, where uh, uh, Alex, I think the last judge <laughs> to me uh, after doing, uh, you know, uh, iterative uh, work uh, was one is. Uh, to be able to create a, a good footprint of tire, uh, yeah. and then and then the other one was in this uh, repetitive test that uh, uh, we keep on doing in the lab, uh, is a mechanical behavior of it to like a plate sinkage, uh, and compenetrometer. Well, of course, the compenetrometer uh, would vary depending on the compaction that you do, but at least in a loose state. The, the plate sinkage and then uh, what you see as the rut depths and the uh, the footprint uh, behavior. So it's kind of a mixed way, uh, I would say. Uh, it's not uh, 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 hit the target of a cohesion and friction angle, uh, but the the uh, the the final bulk response uh, from the split sinkage and the uh, tire testers. Uh, were, uh, which in the tire test so far, it's mainly qualitative, uh, even though the rat depth was very close to what uh, you see uh, in the field, for example, in uh, in this very large uh, ag tires, uh, the, the rat depth was very, very close to uh, what you see in the field. Uh, so does that yeah. answer your question? I know it's not a straightforward answer. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, it, it, it's a it's a difficult uh, issue. Uh, yeah. We had a, a large soil hall, and the soil just happened to be a loam soil, and that was quite convenient. Um, what uh, I did tr try and do is for quite a lot of testing was get the moisture content um, to the same level, as that did make quite a lot of difference. So, for most of uh, uh, the testing. Uh, general testing tried to get the soil up to about uh, close to 14% moisture content, 12 to 14%. Uh, and there's obviously a tendency for it to dry out in a large, uh, large hole on uh, the soil tanks. It's easier to manage. Uh, and did spend a lot of time getting the moisture content back up before doing particularly tests with uh, uh, with student uh, groups. So moisture content was one of the things that. Uh, we could control as well as compaction. And, and that was the, the, the second part of the question, really. And, and it's something that I think we talked a little bit last week about. And, and that was if you've got a, a soil tank and your soil tank um, looks a little bit like the one that uh, Dick Godwin had in, uh, uh, in, in Cranfield. I don't know if you used that as a model at all. Um, in that, uh, uh, you're, 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 you've got soil, and with use, the the subsoil may tend to get more uh, compacted. Did you have a, a a procedure for starting off and uh, loosening, and then getting the soil back into as even a state as possible? Or in, in Cranfield, sometimes they put the soil down in layers, uh, and they used to take the moisture content on a fairly regular basis because that was one of the things that did. Did vary. So the, the next question: Do you have a sort of procedure for preparing the track for doing tests, uh, and do you have a set of tests and a sampling method uh, for uh, each test as you do it? For example, you, you you referred to a few minutes ago and earlier to uh, some of the equations you use, and for something like Genosi and Hanamoto, you need a sort of deformation modulus. So do you use a triaxle or shear box for 
uh, getting soil deformation modulus, uh, or do you um, just do that once and then just rely on that for a series of tests? Okay, no. So uh, in in the soil processing steps, uh, uh, the measurements, uh, the soil measurements include the compenetrometer and the plate sinkage. Uh, that's what we have right now. So for the repeatability of the test, uh, the uh, uh, as you know, uh, you have highlighted that you know having a moisture. Uh, in in the soil processing step uh, is uh, makes what uh, the, the the repeatability challenging uh, and what kind of uh, steps you would do uh, with our soil bin we don't have water so there's no water with this artificial soil right so the yeah the process is the same uh, where we would do uh, the the tiller. Um, and the roller compaction uh, with a load cell uh, uh, monitored uh, and and the blade. Uh, so we have, uh, depending on what test is to do, uh, uh, we uh, I, I have done two extreme tests where the uh, uh, bulk density. Well, that's also another one that we measure, Alex. The bulk density, uh, the bulk density. Uh, range it from like 1.4 uh, uh, megagram per cubic meter or, or 1400, which is kind of loose for a seed bed tillage application in this, all the way to like uh, uh, a practice density uh, value of close to uh, uh, 1.7 megagram per cubic meter. So the compaction range is very good, okay? Uh, and uh, the uh, the processing is uh, is uh, repeatable. Uh, now the advantage so far is the uh, using this artificial soil, we don't deal with uh, with water component of it. Uh, now the disadvantage is if we want to create a, a soil condition that's extremely wet, uh, we have to probably take this out and feel it was uh, you know was. Uh, uh, a natural soil that will take a lot of water. Okay, because uh, um, I, I sort of came to the judgment that around about 12 to 14 percent was quite good conditions in the UK anyway for carrying out uh, cultivation operations. But it, it did take a long time to, I mean, uh, on an open haul, it would take maybe a week of careful uh, water applications to get um, a large area consistently at about 12 or 14 percent. So it is a, it is time consuming, but it does affect cohesion in the, uh, in a, in a loam soil. So that was one of the reasons of always bringing it back. And, and the other one, I suppose, with with water, because I, I noticed you mentioned uh, Reese a little bit earlier um, and back in the early 70s, when I was a student there, um, it used to take, uh, because Reese was mainly working with very cohesive clay soils at that time, it used to take them maybe a month or more before they would actually get their soil contents up to, to where they wanted them for doing uh, tests. And uh, they would even use sort of uh, human mechanical means of, of mixing clay to get this, the, the, the water into the soil. So... Um, it's just that aspect of, of, of how important the water side is um, in terms of trying to get a reference between one set of results and another. Yeah, just to give you a perspective in terms of time, it takes only two hours to, to get a good soil bed on a 10 meter long uh, without worrying about moisture for this cohesion, okay? Uh, yeah. We... Um, my, my, one of my desire or our goal in, in the lab is to have another library of uh, artificial uh, medium, but more cohesive, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, that's a little bit challenging, uh, at least from uh, so what uh, what uh, uh, what we are trying to do right now, because one of the criteria is the uh, the uh, the material has to have the same properties. So this is it's uh, getting to its third year. 
so the uh, material behavior of this uh, does not degrade yet. So if you bring more cohesive uh, medium into artificial, sometimes they might degrade over time. So uh, we don't have a very high uh, representative cohesive material yet in the artificial uh, uh, domain. Yeah. Thank you, though, for uh, at least well, I need to go back and look at uh, some of the earlier works, how high was the cohesion? Um, well, I think uh, uh, the, the a lot of the plate tests that Rees may have done, without going back and checking, they may well have been on cohesive soils. Uh, when I was a student in the early 70s, he was spending a lot of time on just clay uh, and even doing a test with very large uh, uh, vehicles in very, very uh, pure clay um, uh, sites. So... Um, I'd need to go back and, and, and uh, read it as well. But, but it may well be that some of the papers put uh, constraints or limitations. I know I think you referred to that uh, Genosi and Honomoto, and I think uh, there and also Wismer and Luth, one or two others, they may well have uh, a section at the end where they put limitations on the range of applicability of some of the uh, results and equations they've got. Thank but you. it's uh, this this area of soil preparation is is something that uh, sometimes gets a little bit overlooked, and as particularly when you're starting research, it's uh, uh, it's it it, it it sort of occupies uh, your mind as much as anywhere else for quite a time. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I have a follow up question on Dr. Keane's question uh, about the soil prep. Um, you mentioned the bulk density is between uh, 1,400 and 1,700 kilograms per meter cube. Um, and you mentioned that you use a rolling drum with uh, um, a load cell on it to control the compaction. But how do you know that, how do you measure the in-situ density? And then how do you know the top layer is not more dense um, than the bottom layer? How do you ensure homogeneity and like, how do you measure it? Sure, sure. Yeah, I think uh, if I, if you look at uh, the, at least the test procedures that we have so far, uh, you know that's a big library of you know variables that that could be changed to create a different scenarios. So f within that uh, a half meter, the bulk density that I mentioned is is from the top, you know, at the end, uh, the profile, the profile. Uh, the measurement uh, 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 I did was using a cone penetrometer, and it's not really. If you look at uh, you know any kind of cone penetrometer, it uh, it increases um, uh, to, to a certain magnitude yeah, well, and then decreases. So still, it has that. So it's not like uh, when I say uh, uniform, uh, it's more uniform from. Uh, the magnitude of, uh, you know, the tilling, the processing that you put, uh, but the soil profile itself may not have the same density, which is not even possible uh, uh, anyway. So the, uh, the repeatability is two ways. Uh, one is vertical, another one is uh, longitudinal section. Uh, so when I say the bulk density uh, able to create this uh, different uh, wide spectrum, uh, it's from a measurement of the top soil. And then, how did you how did you measure that? Like uh, the oh. in-situ density with like an inverse cone or uh, yeah, we like have planetary or uh, yeah, it's a core core sampler, uh, which is like three inches by you know a two inch uh, height cylinder. Uh, we just push it down and then take it out and and measure the. Uh, you know the, the the traditional bulk density measurement. The okay, thank you very core, much. Core sample, core sample method. Yes. Okay, thank you. I'm I'm just asking because I'm busy constructing my own soil pen. So, uh, yeah, for bevometer testing. Okay, um, I saw uh, popping up in the people list, uh, Professor Vladimir. Vancevich, he was having some technical issues, but uh, he's with us now. And so 
Uh, Vladimir, of course, is the co-editor in chief of the Journal of Terra Mechanics. And so, Vladimir, if uh, you would like to to join the live the live conversation, uh, please click uh, the blue button on the on the top right corner of the page, and one of our moderators will uh, will get you through. We would really like to to have you here if you are so inclined. And uh, in the meantime, I just uh, realized that I had um, a question uh, in the Q&A uh, uh, back at the beginning of the queue. So while Vladimir gets ready, uh, maybe I can... Hi, Hi Vladimir. Hi. Uh, maybe uh, I'm I sorry I'm late and uh, sorry for bothering you with all my problems but I finally was able to get to the event. Uh, unfortunately, I missed it most of part. I know Miharis and his group uh, research was very happy to be here. Uh, Mihari, if it would be possible, I would like to see the slides afterwards uh, and uh, hope the event went well and I will be online on time next time for sure. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, as uh, as you know, we are uh, we are recording all the events, and so and then the link to the recordings will be shared. So, so everyone who could not attend, who has had any problems, will have uh, will have the chance to to see the the recordings afterward. And um, okay, D did you? I know you you joined just now. Is was there anything uh, specific you still wanted to say to Mahari, or you are you just waiting for the recording? Um, uh, the only question I would like probably to ask, and probably this would be interesting for the for all other audience, uh, Mihari, when you measuring slippage of the tire, experimental measuring slippage of the tire, what is the mode of operation? How you move your wheel at zero slippage. What do you accept for the baseline for zero slippage? This would be probably interesting for all of, to all of us uh, to see what you do when you measure slippage. Thank you. So if I understand that, uh, uh, zero slippage or uh, at, uh, uh, you know, uh, hard ground ro rolling radius, I just did not. What, whatever you do, you're using the hard uh, road rolling radius at zero moment, at zero torque, sure. or you have zero applied to the torque and the wheel is moving under the action of the torque only when you have zero slippage, when you don't have any dropper pull. Sure. Sure. So uh, yeah. just, just yeah. would be very interesting. We're always debating this in the Journal of Terra Mechanics. <laughs> sure. Uh, I think for the, the uh, you know, the zero rolling radius, uh, uh, what we do is we run the test, the, the tire uh, on the, uh, the sole bin uh, uh, has a bed, it's a, it's a steel. So that's what uh, we had, uh, you know, run and trying to characterize a zero rolling radius or, or ground condition under hard uh, surface. And maybe that's uh, open for discussion if that is a good approach or not. Uh, now for, uh, you know, ru uh, running uh, this one in a towed condition, uh, this uh, rig system uh, is, is controlled through lab view and uh, you could uh, set it to go under, uh, you know, no torque applied. So that represents uh, the no towing condition uh, which measures only the motion resistance. Uh, if you want to apply uh, the slip, uh, it has a control mechanism where the carriage speed is going to be the travel speed. And uh, the, uh, in this case, the tire uh, uh, speed will be, uh, will be controlled uh, by the uh, um, RPM on, uh, on the wheel. Yeah, great. So, yeah. It's a, it's a very uh, a robust uh, uh, yeah. uh, procedure in the yeah. uh, in the lab view. The thing that I didn't check, uh, well, that's what the grad students are here. Is, uh, uh, 
to how high the the slippage we would uh, would measure. Um, right, right. Bias right down the notch. So this is for you and the three. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I always uh, go with the rolling radius um, in the uh, at the at zero moment at zero torque on asphalt for uh, as the baseline for uh, slippage of the tire. Practically the same what you do. I just wanted to to know yeah. what yeah. your opinion. On that. Thank you very much. I appreciate. It. Thank, you. Thank you. And we clean the floor to not have any any like. Uh, you know, friction coefficients has not representative for that steel uh, geometry. Um, we don't have the data measured on the friction coefficient between the rubber and the steel of bed yet. Uh, maybe that's also another good thing that hopefully we could uh, we could have the data for this lab. Okay, thanks, thanks Vladimir and. Um, I was saying, I realized I had uh, a question in the Q&A tab uh, right at the bottom uh, of the queue by an, an anonymous, anonymous attendee. So I'm going to read it for you. So uh, how will you go about obtaining the physical tire properties and what method will you use to validate this model? Yeah, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I uh, try to collaborate uh, with, uh, you know, with the right lab, uh, either uh, academic institution or some of the uh, consulting companies, just to, to see, because that part is is our limitation right now, and uh, I think uh, I'm afraid that uh, we may not be able to you know, to get it um, to the level where the state of the art is in a very short period of time. Uh, I think during this, uh, what I would like to jump in is, you know, uh, this is uh, a lab that uh, 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 was, uh, uh, you know, come to this state with a lot of effort from uh, uh, collaborators, industry, Caterpillar, uh, Iowa State, um, and uh, uh, a company uh, for the wear test. So to me, I think if there are interests in visiting scholars, either from uh, uh, academic institutions uh, or, or private industry, uh, you're most welcome. We will host you. Uh, maybe some of this uh, uh, this uh, state of the art, especially in the tire uh, tire side, either in the measurement or in the modeling side. Um, we would like to host uh, you know visiting scholars to 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 the lab and to the university at the end it's it's a win win situation was having uh, a diverse uh, uh, capability and that's the answer that i have it's no but i think it would also be open for uh, you know for collaborators in that area uh, Masim. okay thank you very much and i see we have a final question from from George. Uh, so George, since you are still uh, live here, I guess you can ask it for yourself. I, I, I know we're running over, uh, I guess, on time, but th 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 these tests run in the 60s and 70s at the core, they would run progressive slip and uniform slip, uh, either setting the slip of the tire at 20% or starting the tire at a negative 40 to 60% going up to positive. 40 to 60, sometimes 100. Uh, is that is that kind of the way you're running these tests? Yeah, so George, uh, we can run both positive and negative, uh, but we haven't tested, you know, how how low and how high to go. Uh, okay. Yeah, I've tested it, I think, around 15 and 20 just for the demo, uh, but I uh, I didn't see, you know, I didn't quantify or, or record it to, to what? maximum either positive or negative to go yes so, sometimes it, if you have a four by four six by six vehicle the transfer of, of slip between tires gets critical in trying to optimize traction so um, this goes back to Vladimir's question if you started negative 40 percent slip and go up to say positive 40 percent slip 
at, at zero percent, you should see something, uh, maybe nothing. You, you may see zero torque or zero pull, but that's that's where you can begin to look at these initial conditions. And, and um, actually, no, if you, if you so, and the, the next question would. Uh, there's all sorts of questions you can tease out of it. Uh, can you get positive torque at, at negative slip and things like that? I, I've seen this in, in the lab, or lab data come out <laughs> and, um, you know, so, some tests like that would support it um, and, and may help optimize some controllers or ha help de design controllers to be optimized. Um, anyway, but that's that's all. That's, uh, the, oh, the equations you showed earlier, they're, they're power equations. So they they go to, I think they all go to infinity at negative slip. So I'm, I'm not sure they will help validate that information. There, I think they're uh, Paducah, the magic tire model is, is one that has um, uh, uh, plus or minus slip predictions for pull. Um, I don't think I'm pronouncing that right, but Deka, but Deka. There may be one or two more. Anyway, that, that's, that's all. Pachik. Yeah, Pachik. 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 All right. Thank you. Thank you for letting me. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, George. And okay, let me uh, reshare re -share my screen and. Uh, I, I would really like to thank again uh, Mahari and, and his team for their presentation today and all the staff here at ISTVS that is contributing to make these events possible. And of course, every one of you uh, attending today. And we have just a couple more things uh, before we let you go as usual. So. Uh, you can find all the information you need on our upcoming events in the series, uh, schedules, speakers, uh, registration links uh, at the website that you see here uh, on the right hand side uh, in the slide on screen. And um, I would also like to invite all the student uh, research groups out there uh, to join us in this initiative and consider being our next speakers to take advantage of this opportunity to give uh, an informal look uh, at your research work. So if you are interested, please uh, email me uh, at gs at istvs.org uh, to get on the schedule and uh, really uh, invite you uh, to consider doing so. And uh, also, as you know, uh, this series is our uh, build up to the ISTVS conference, which takes place online from September 27th to 29th. And you can find uh, every information at the conference website that you uh, see here on screen on the left, on the left hand side. And yes, now that's, uh, that's really it. And uh, thanks again, everyone. Uh, have, uh, have a good day and uh, see you at the next event and at the conference. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you.